Hello and welcome back to Warrior Radio. I'm Tony Baldwin and today's episode I sit down with Dr. Jerry Brown who is an anthropologist, an author, and an activist. Now, from 1972 to 2014, he served as founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, where he designed and taught a course on hallucinogens and culture, which actually examined uh, the use of psychoactive plants in various tribal and classical cultures. Now, Jerry and his wife, Julie, uh, recently wrote a fascinating book called The Psychedelic Gospels. Now, throughout the medieval Christianity, religious works of art were used to illustrate lessons from the Bible to a largely uh, illiterate audience. And throughout this time, churches in places like Turkey and places like England and France, uh, they started to create religious artwork with psychoactive mushrooms uh, within them. And uh, by chance... Uh, Jerry and Julie stumbled upon one of these churches, which led them on uh, just a journey to uncover some of these little-known psychedelic works of art throughout ancient European churches. And ultimately, they were really just looking to answer the question, what role psychedelics played in early Christianity? And, you know, through these hidden works of art that I just talked about, and through the ancient Gnostic Gospels, which were actually some of the original ancient Christian texts that were only discovered just a handful of decades ago, all of this started to give clues that psychedelics may have played a major role in the earliest years of the Christian religion. So in this interview, we get into all this. Uh, Jerry shares the mysterious psychedelic artwork that he uncovered. Uh, He talks about Jesus' supposed experiences with psychedelics. Um, that's actually referenced in the Gnostic Gospel. And he gets into how the church just suddenly suppressed this information and just ended any type of psychedelic use uh, in the religion. And we also get into various other civilizations and just the pivotal role psychedelics played in them. Uh, You know, from the Rig Vedas of India writing about a powerful substance called Soma, which dates back almost 6,000 years ago. Uh, to ancient Greece and a rite of passage involving psychedelics referred to as the uh, Eleusinian Mysteries. Um, We also get into ancient Siberia, how uh, the practices that we know today of Christmas actually has its roots with uh, reindeer shamans and their use of psilocybin mushrooms. So it's really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, Talking with Jerry... Uh, it was almost like talking to the Indiana Jones of the psychedelic world. Um, and, you know, with him sharing all these just mysterious stories from ancient cultures and his travels around the world and covering psychedelic works of art throughout, um, you know, Europe. So this was really one of my favorite episodes to date. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. And uh, if you do, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, Warrior Radio. Give us a rating, leave your thoughts, and share this podcast with a friend. So with all that said, let's get into today's episode with Dr. Jerry Brown. Enjoy. For those that don't know, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Sure. Uh, My name is Jerry Brown, Uh, not the governor of California. I'm an anthropologist by training. Um, I was a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami for many years, from 1972 to uh, 2014 when I retired. Uh, After my first LSD trip in the uh, early 70s, I designed and taught a course on hallucinogens and culture, which I taught every year at Florida International University. And so became quite immersed in both the uh, case studies, the literature about psychedelic use uh, throughout history, which a lot of people forgot about when when the acid wave of the 1960s hit. They thought they didn't realize, uh, even Leary, that there was uh, even a Western tradition. Uh, Having had that background in 2006, when my wife Julie and I were on an anniversary trip 
to Scotland. We visited Roslyn Chapel, drawn there by uh, the Da Vinci Code book, which saw it as a, a possible resting place of the Holy Grail. While there, I discovered a psychoactive Amanita muscaria mushroom embedded in the forehead, sculpted into the forehead of the most prominent green man of Roslyn. And that started a whole line of speculation of what did Sir William Sinclair, who built Roslyn in the 15th century, uh, was he was he giving us coded messages about psychedelics in, in Christianity? Because this is a Catholic church. And um, after you know getting away, carried away a little bit by rambunctious speculation, uh, we realized that the only way to support these kinds of extraordinary claims about a possible role of psychedelics in Christianity was to go out and gather the evidence. In anthropology, we say, go do the field work. So in 2012, uh, my wife and co-author Julie and I undertook a trip uh, throughout Europe and the Middle East, visiting churches and chapels and cathedrals and looking for evidence of psychedelics. And we found it in all of the nine places that we visited from uh, small chapels in France to the uh, Canterbury Cathedral in England to remote cave churches in Turkey. And that at a certain point, uh, we realized this is an alternative gospel. This is a message in stone, a message in frescoes, a message in mosaics that psychedelics had a role in Christianity. And that's what inspired us to write the book. Wow. Well, I definitely want to get into all that in this interview. But before we do, can you take us through that the first few uh, psychedelic experiences you had uh, back in the day and what really inspired you to start teaching, uh, you know, the history of psychedelics uh, in sure. academia? Absolutely. Yeah, my first experience was at um, uh, something called the Rainbow Family Gathering. Uh, it was an annual gathering uh, sort of an early Burning Man, way preceding Burning Man, of people who would go into the national forests and uh, and explore psychedelics. And uh, a friend of mine invited me to go on this, and I went, and I had my first um, LSD experience there, and uh, it was it led to quite a disorienting and tumultuous time in my life. Now, of course, since set and setting. Uh, and dosage uh, have a great deal to do with psychedelic experience. I was in a tumultuous time. I was going through a divorce and uh, the I, I kind of got spun out on it and, and got a bit paranoid. And I was reading all of this literature about instant illumination, levels 24 Satori, cosmic consciousness. And I said, it was kind of, uh, I'm not having this kind of experience. And, and of course, it really inspired me to try to understand what was going on with these very powerful mind altering substances. So I decided to design and teach a course to explore this for myself and for others. And it wasn't going to be a just say no course, um, obviously, and it, nor was it going to be psychedelics are a panacea, as some people were claiming, and um, you know, going to lead to instant world peace. So I decided to put together a series of case studies uh, that were well documented in the research and the literature uh, starting out with the role of Soma in the Hindu Rig Veda, one of the world's oldest religious texts, uh, taking us through the classical society of the use of the Kikion, which is a psychedelic substance, an air god of rye and barley in Greece, and going through many of the shamanic cultures from those like such as you explored in the Amazon to the Fang of uh, Africa, and then came up to the modern mind explorers, the Timothy Leary's of the world, the John Lilly's of the world, the Stanislav Grof's, uh, Stanislav Grof being the founder of LSD psychotherapy. What really drew them? Why, why were these substances have such powerful impacts on their lives and, and cause them to sort of drop what they were doing before and devote themselves to the study of uh, psychedelics? And uh, one of the things uh, I've come to appreciate about the course is I don't have a particular uh, theory or a particular substance or a particular program to promote. It's sort of an overview, and, and people kind of like it. And my students tell me that, hey, Dr. Brown, I haven't, I've never heard of 95% of what you're talking about. So I know there's a lot of information from the world history of psychedelics and uh, bringing all of this together 
and sharing it with people. And I hope to share it eventually, this course on the Internet. Uh, this has definitely become uh, one of the passions for myself and, and Julie in our lives. Yeah. Now, you, you spoke of the Rig Veda, which, uh, for those that don't know, is an ancient Indian collection of Vedic San- Sanskrit hymns. Um, and it's one of the most <laughs> sacred texts in the Hindu religion. And like you were saying, it talks of a substance called Soma. So can you speak a little bit about this and the history and what you know about sure. the Soma and um, the Rig Veda? Absolutely. So uh, when the Rig Veda was translated, so the Rig Veda is one of the world's oldest religious texts. I was it was it came down from an oral transition, oral tradition. It came down from an oral tradition uh, carried by the original Aryan people out of central Eurasia, uh, you know, 6000 plus years ago. And they settled in the Indus Valley in uh, what eventually became India. And among their gods was a trifold god, a plant, a god, and the juice of the plant. And the, and the plant was Soma. And one of the ten cycles, the ten mandalas of the Rig Veda, is highly devoted in praise of Soma. And when this was translated into the English and the French and the German, uh, people were were befuddled what manner of plant was this because when you looked at the botanical descriptions given about soma it was really a strange plant it didn't have branches it didn't have leaves it didn't have a a bark it didn't have a trunk and it had no visible seeds what manner of plant could this be and it was described in the rig veda in the poetic language because the priests and the and the participants in the soma ritual of that time they knew exactly what they were talking about they didn't have to go to any lengths to um, describe it in, in words that would make any sense today. It was the mainstay of the sky. It was the pillar of the heavens. Eventually, R. Gordon Wasson, the father of modern ethnomycology, the study of the way in which different cultures explore and, and understand um, uh, mushrooms, broke the code of Soma. And he realized that it was the psychoactive Amanita muscaria mushroom, that brilliant red and white spotted mushroom <coughs> that exists in the northern climes in the tundra and taiga throughout Siberia, um, above six to 8,000 feet in the, in the mountains, that it was that particular plant. And one of the keys and, and one of the um, kind of really enigmatic aspects of Soma was they talked about drinking, ingesting Soma through the urine of the shaman who took it. And for us, this is yuck. I mean, this is, why would anyone do that? And it turns out that muscamol and muscarine, the psychoactive agents in Amanita muscaria are not well metabolized by the body. And there is evidence of, um, of uh, people holding their cups around the shaman's yurt when he comes out, uh, urinates and drinking the urine. And this provided a key piece of the puzzle because there's a passage in the in the Rig Veda where it talks about Indra coming to piss Soma day by day like a stag assuming uh, its most mighty force. Uh, the reindeer herders use Soma. They know about this tradition in Siberia. It is still practiced today. And the reindeer love Soma. And we talk about this in a, in a chapter in the book about uh, Santa Santa Claus, the reindeer shaman. Uh, so, but basically here we have in one of the foundation texts of one of the world's great religion, a psychoactive mushroom. And this is a huge clue to the fact that before the modern era, before reading and writing, um, before uh, we moved into a scientific worldview, that the, the knowledge and praise of this plant ran through cultures throughout Asia, throughout the Middle East, and what is it, it becomes one of the foundation studies for understanding uh, the role of psychedelics uh, in the modern world. So it has a large part there. And once this, the code of Soma was broken by Wasson and many Sanskrit scholars accepted it and it solved many of the enigmas that could not be explained without proposing a psychoactive plant as the key to the Rig Veda. Once it did this, it sort of opened the eyes of scholars 
to go back and look at other cultures, whether it be ancient Greece, in our case, Christianity, in uh, Benny Shannon's case, um, the, the Old Testament, and say, is there evidence that we have overlooked because of our modern bias against hallucinogens? And now the doors have kind of been flung wide open. So we see a revisiting of ancient cultures and also a psychedelic renaissance, which I can get into later underway, where we're getting a second chance to evaluate the medical and scientific applications of psychedelics. So psychedelics have been found, obviously used in peyote among the um, the Plains Indians, the Apache, the Kiowa, and others. Uh, psilocybin is used in, in the Mazatec, in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And ayahuasca, as you know well, among the Conibo, Jivaro of the Amazon Basin. And so um, it's really a very fascinating and rich interdisciplinary field of study that combines anthropology, art history, uh, theology. But the Rig Veda is certainly one of the foundation texts for this whole area of study. Yeah, and another uh, culture that seems to always pop up in a lot of anthropologist uh, discussions is ancient Greece. And you said um, they have a substance that they used in uh, a famous rite of passage that uh, a lot of people know as the Eleusinian Mysteries. So can you talk a little bit about um, ancient Greece and these mysteries and how um, how it was used? Absolutely. Yes. Um, the amazing thing about the Eleusinian Mysteries is that in when we're looking at ancient shamanism, we don't have much archaeological evidence to, to go by. Uh, sometimes we have practices that have gone down to the modern age. But in the case of Eleusis, uh, the, the temple of Demeter uh, in praise of the Eleusinian mysteries that was built at Eleusis about 14 kilometers west of Athens, that archaeological site remains today. And the Eleusinian mysteries were practiced there for 2,000 years from about 1400 BC to about uh, 400 AD when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire and Eleusis was sort of decimated. It went from being a local cult in praise of, of the goddess Demeter to being a, a, a cult uh, and a religion that was practiced throughout ancient Greece and then throughout Rome when the Roman Emperor Empire took over and Roman emperors went to Eleusis. Uh, there was a potion. So, so anyone can visit Eleusis today and see the archaeological ruins. There was a potion called the Kikion that was ingested at Eleusis in the Telesterion, which was the building uh, that could seat about 3,000 people in which the Holy of Holies of the Eleusinian Mysteries uh, took place. Most of the major Greek figures that we know went to and participated in Eleusis and Pindar, the poet and, and uh, Pindar and, and um, Socrates and Plato participated and wrote in glowing terms about Eleusis that the person who has gone there, uh, they will not fear death. They will walk happily into the afterlife and their life will be uh, enriched. Wasson became very curious after breaking the code of Soma about could there be a psychoactive substance at Eleusis? And he gathered a brilliant interdisciplinary team that included Carl Rook, a classical Greek scholar, and Albert Hoffman, the chemist who synthesized first synthesized LSD in his laboratory in Switzerland in 1938. And to Albert Hoffman, he posed the question, are there any substances growing here in the area of Eleusis that are psychoactive and that could have been the agent in the Kikion. And after a several years of analysis, Hoffman came back and he says, yes, there is a fungal growth, uh, Claviceps purpea. It grows on barley and rye and it's found in the plains around Eleusis. And barley was one of the components um, that went into the um, Eleusinian drink. So here we have something that uh, is uh, really the, the foundations of Western civilization are tied in 
uh, obviously to to the incredible explosion of intellectual and artistic and political capacity that happened in ancient Greece. And once and again, we find um, a psychoactive substance uh, there uh, involved in those early years. Now, now in Eleusis, uh, from what I understand, it was almost a rite of passage for a lot of people. Uh, they'd stay there for, uh, you know, a few days, a few weeks at a time. What, from your understanding, what happened in, uh, in that event? Sure. And, and you're absolutely right. It is a rite of passage in the true sense of the word in that uh, people would prepare uh, at one time of the year, they'd go through a series of rituals called the Lesser Rites, and then they would prepare to make the pilgrimage uh, out of ancient Greece. And you can still see the sacred way that leads out near the uh, the Parthenon in ancient Greece towards Eleusis. Part of that road is still there. So they would, as initiates, uh, sing and dance and go to Eleusis. They were prepared by the priests and priestesses. There was a, a a, a family that kept the secrets of Eleusis uh, that lived <coughs> that lived on site. Uh, people were prepared for it. There were a number of other rites and rituals and ba- bathes and ritual cleansings. And then they would be initiated um, on the uh, high point of the Eleusinian rituals uh, by the hierophants who would distribute the drink of the Eleusinian uh, mystery. It was considered and and. You know, a lot of people think um, these things were suppressed, even in the Catholic Church. And and one of our main points is that secrecy is not suppression. Uh, When you're dealing with, you know, the holy of holies, whether it be in in whatever religion, uh, very often it's shrouded in secrecy. Um, In in a lot of shamanistic practices, people are not supposed to talk about what they experience because it's between them and the divine. And. At Eleusis, you were not allowed to speak about your experience except on pain of death. In fact, one of Socrates' um, friends, who was a general who was leading a war in Sicily, was recalled from his generalship and condemned to death. Condemned, he was recalled from his his leadership, military leadership, and condemned to death. Uh, because he profaned the Eleusinian mysteries and was using the substance at parties in his home. And rather than accept that sentence, unlike Socrates, who drank the hemlock, uh, this general fled to Sparta. So it just shows you how strict um, the secrecy are, and how holy and, and, and in what high reverence they um, they treated the Eleusinian mysteries. Wow, um, and another culture uh, that uh, has a lot of history with uh, psychedelics uh, is ancient Siberia. Um, and you were speaking about shamans and their role with reindeer. Can you talk a little bit about uh, this ah. this area? Oh yeah, th- this is kind of interesting and. Uh, <coughs> This is very interesting. And, and uh, when we talk about the chapter on uh, in the book of Santa, the reindeer shaman, uh, in that trip to Scotland, Julie and I went up to the Cairngorm Mountains, the highest mountains in Scotland. And we found that there was a reindeer center and there was the only um, wild reindeer herd outside of, of Eurasia was there. And we went up with the guides at the reindeer center to visit the reindeer. And we found out that these reindeer love Amanita muscaria. And there was one reindeer who was off to the side. His name was Circus. And he uh, just stood there kind of staring at the sun. And when Julie asked, why is he off on the side? And said, well, he sort of, the guide told us the Timothy Leary of reindeer. He loves him so much that during uh, mushroom season, he gorges himself and just stands there staring into the sun. So... Uh, It was kind of an interesting connection and reading further into Gordon Wasson's seminal work, uh, which is called Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality. He traces the Soma practice all the way back to ancient Siberia, where there is uh, a reindeer herder, reindeer, Amanita muscaria complex. And the uh, shamanic people uh, use this in their rituals. All of the modern memes of our Christmas uh, story can be traced back uh, to 
this particular uh, reindeer herder cult in Siberia. And so we found that this practice is ongoing uh, until today. Uh, so the idea of flying reindeer, the idea that reindeer can transport you um, into the cosmic, up to the cosmic uh, tree, up into the uh, upper reaches of the supernatural world. This is all part of Siberian shamanism. Can you talk a little bit about uh, its its role in Christmas? Because uh, not a lot of people know that uh, the history that Christmas actually a good chance it comes from this ancient Siberia and the the roles of psychedelics and these reindeers. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, we talk about in the book Santa, the archetypal shaman, and. Our, our contemporary image of Santa Claus as a rotund, jolly, white-bearded fellow with a red suit uh, with white trim, the kind of same colors of the Amanita the mushroom, it, he's the archetypal Siberian mushroom uh, shaman. And what happens here is that after the mushroom harvest is complete, the shaman collects his gifts in a sack. And he first of all, he dries them. Uh, because you can transport them more easily once they're dried and he puts them out. Uh, the key thing to realize here is that the Amanita muscaria mushroom, uh, the soma of the Hindu Rig Veda, it grows in a symbiotic relationship with evergreen trees, with firs and conifers. And what that means is its invisible spores take come through the air and they um, – they fall to the ground and they germinate in the humus of the decaying pine needles. And then when there's rains and a thunderstorm, they practically pop up overnight in a white veiled mushroom that when the cap uh, peels back, uh, then you have your brilliant red Amanita muscaria mushroom with the sort of popcorn uh, polka dotted colored uh, around the cap. So he dries his, his uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom on the branches of the Christmas tree, literally. And then he brings them back uh, to the yurt. And if his yurt in the depth of winter is covered with snow around the outsides and the entrance is blocked, he'll come down through the chimney <coughs> hole on top of the yurt. So sort of coming down through the a chimney to deliver his gifts, the brilliant mind expanding Amanita muscaria plant to the appreciative members of, of his clan. Uh, they string them up around the fireplace and in the morning they awaken uh, to a, f- a ritual feast of dried magic mushrooms. And these are the Christmas gifts now in the stockings around the fireplace. Once they've ingested the mushrooms, you know, how do they get around the world? Well, they're, they're taken by the flying reindeer. And obviously, it's Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, not the green-nosed reindeer, not the purple-nosed reindeer. Um, and they're guided by the spirits that, according to the um, reindeer herder people, live within the mushroom. These are, these are Santa's little helpers from the North Pole. So you have a very interesting... Siberian reindeer herder mushroom complex that goes back to time immemorial. Today, there's about 300,000 reindeer herders uh, distributed through the far northeast of uh, Russia, in the central area of Russia, and also some areas of of Scandinavia. And all of these themes, uh, including the image of Santa Claus, the Christmas tree, the flying reindeer pulling his sleigh, Santa coming down the chimney, exchanging these precious gifts in the dead of winter. Um, Even these elves who reside with Santa at the North Pole can be traced back to these uh, pagan roots. Wow. And and do you know any uh, history of how uh, sort of these pagan roots transitioned into just everyday culture that we see? Um, How did how did uh, sort of certain cultures take just uh, certain practices of that without the psychedelics? And how did that translate into the Christmas that we know today? Well, you know, what you have are vestiges in in many aspects of mythology and culture. You have vestiges of of ancient practices. And 
this um, this was obviously a deep cultural history that was known, uh, obviously, with the coming of Christianity, uh, especially after the Inquisition, uh, the, the use of psychedelics went to the back burner and was persecuted um, as a practice of satanic witches uh, during the um, Inquisition. Inqu- during the Inquisition and up into the early Renaissance. So it was all pushed to the back burner of culture. But these themes that we'd wonder about, you know, what has Santa Claus got to do with Christmas? Santa Claus certainly never appears in the Christian Bible. So why is this celebration of of Santa Claus and Christmas uh, taking place at this particular time? And what we find is that, and I can get into this uh, more uh, at, a, at a later time in our discussion, you know, what we find is that Santa becomes Satan in Christianity and the horned God, that shamanic figure of wearing the dancing shaman, wearing the reindeer um, robes and with the reindeer uh, horns on his head, uh, he becomes uh, the horned God of, of, of Satanism. So we see a real reversal, a cultural reversal uh, that takes place here and that sort of colored uh, throughout the Western tradition until modern times and obviously even into the 1960s um, are images of psychedelia uh, in the Western world. Wow. Now, a lot of your work was uh, first uh, research with from the work of Gordon Wasson. And for those that don't know, he was one of the founders of the 60s psychedelic movement. Um, and uh, like you were saying, he was the father of ethnomycology. Uh, but he started off as a J.P. Morgan banker. So can you talk us through uh, sort of Gordon Wasson's history? How did he come from being sort of this <laughs> successful traditional banker to, you know, s- studying different mushrooms and different psychedelics throughout the world? Well, for your listeners, this is absolute proof of you never know where life is going to take you. And uh, Wasson um, came from a very strict religious family. Uh, He and his brother, uh, his father had them. They read the Bible. (coughs) They read through the Bible and interpreted it three times when he was a young man. Uh, His father, I believe, was Episcopalian. And uh, he went into journalism and he went into finance journalism and he ended up doing public relations for J.P. Morgan. He helped develop the field of international public relations and banking. And he rose to be, it was at J.P. Morgan uh, for many years and rose to be a senior vice president. Uh, He married a white Russian. That means a a woman, um, uh, Valentina from a family that fled the Red Russian Revolution. And on their honeymoon in the Catskills, uh, Valentina ran off the path and and gathered mushrooms. She was overjoyed because she had not seen the likes of these uh, since uh, as a younger woman in Russia. And Wasson, who was from a, a, you know, Anglo-Saxon background that had fears and phobias about mushrooms, said, what are you doing with those filthy toadstools? And she said, I'm gathering. I'm going to make mushroom soup for dinner. I'm going to dry them. We're going to have delicious food. And he said, you're not going to eat these poisonous toadstools. This was their first fight, which she won. And it started one of the most fascinating conversations in the history of ethnobotany, where she, he recognized that she was from a Slavic culture that adored mushrooms. He was <coughs> from an English speaking culture that since Shakespeare and others I mean, uh, Macbeth starts off, paddock anon, fair as foul and foul as fair, doth hover for the dank and nasty air. That's not a direct quote, but paddock anon is a, is a, a medieval uh, Middle English word for mushroom. So this got them into a huge conversation about the differences. They coined the word microphobe and mycophil, peak cultures that love mushrooms and cultures that fear mushrooms. And that started them looking and classifying the different cultures of the world. Uh, They eventually got on the case study of Soma and became aware of the enigma enigma and puzzle of what was Soma in the Rig Veda. And out of that research, Valentina died of uh, cancer, unfortunately, and Wasson continued the research. 
Wasson did seminal studies of the role of mushrooms, obviously in the Hindu Rig Veda, among the Siberian reindeer herders, and the Eleusinian mysteries of Greece, and then took his studies to the amazing find of a living mushroom cult among the Mazatec Indians of Oaxaca in uh, southern Mexico. So these were four of the major studies that Wasson did that laid the foundation for the modern study of hallucinogens and culture. Uh, in the process, Wasson did become um, the un one of the unwitting founders of the modern psychedelic movement because his work made it respectable to study and explore mushrooms. And some people, uh, it, it, it sort of laid the intellectual foundation and also, unfortunately, uh, <coughs> inspired a lot of people to go visit uh, Oaxaca, Mexico, in search of magic mushrooms. And people as distinguished as the Beatles and Bob Dylan even made that journey, much to the detriment of the indigenous community in Oaxaca. Yeah, and what? he he was really famous for this. Like you were saying, people like the the the, the Beatles came there, and lots of other famous musicians went there. And um, there was a healer named Maria Sabina that was really uh, really popular. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, just the Oaxaca culture, Maria Sabina, and uh, Mexico's history with magic mushrooms? Sure, absolutely. Um, that history goes all the way back and predates the Aztecs, and it was well documented in Aztec civilization. Uh, we have a picture in our book called The God of the Flowers or the Prince of the Flowers, <clears throat> which is a statue found on a hillside around Tenochtitlan, uh, the Aztec capital, which is decorated, uh, a stone figure decorated with psychoactive uh, plants. So it was well known as part of Aztec prophecy and shamanism, and not only among the Aztecs, but among the Maya, among the Huichol, who, who went on an annual peyote quest. Uh, so it was well known there. Uh, Wasson eventually got word that there was a living magic mushroom culture thriving among the Mazatec of Oaxaca. And he made a journey, uh, I think his first trip uh, took place in 1955, and he was introduced to Maria Sabina, uh, a Mazatec shaman woman, who at the urging of the uh, uh, official, the public official, uh, the, the local uh, political official, invited Wasson to participate in her all night healing ceremony. And Wasson was there with um, his a photographer who came down with him from New York uh, to document this. Maria Sabina, invited him into this ceremony. He had a life-changing uh, uh, experience. He called it a soul-shattering experience where he actually realized you could experience the divine, you could experience infinity through psychoactive mushrooms. She asked him and beseeched him not to publish photographs of the ceremony, to use it only for his own private use and his friends. And in one of the saddest parts of this whole history, he violated that trust and he published her photograph in Life magazine, which was a very popular magazine in the 1950s. And that led to all of these uh, spiritual seekers uh, inundating uh, Oaxaca. Uh, Maria Sabina went through very difficult times because the other people in the community um, felt she had betrayed the secrecy code uh, of the magic mushrooms. And even though she was at that time a recognized and powerful shaman because she had used these mushrooms to cure her sister who had been deathly ill and to cure many people, uh, it was a violation of a taboo. So it uh, was one of the things that to me is a black, one of several black marks on Gordon Wasson's otherwise illustrious career. And however, he found, he said, look, if, if I can prove that there are descendants of the Siberian reindeer people who migrated across the Bering land bridge back some 15, 20,000 years ago, and when they lost access to Soma, 
which grows up in the mountains, they looked for other psychoactive plants because this was an essential portal to the supernatural world that is the key to shamanism. And if I can find a living mushroom cult, it's proof of my theory that there was a pervasive role of, of psychedelics or entheogens, plants, sacred plants that generate the divine within, that these plants were pervasive throughout the ancient world, and there are some cultural islands, living cultural islands of them that remain today. So Maria Sabina is both one of the most important studies that he did, but also one of the more tragic studies. In fact, he recorded her mushroom velada, uh, which took place in the Mazatec language, and it is published today and available on uh, CD at Folkway Records, Folkway Records, uh, with liner notes which show you the Mazatec, the Spanish, and the English translation of her ceremony. And he, it, it's one of the greatest works in this area in anthropology. So uh, the Mazatec uh, community is now today alive and well and thriving. Uh, Maria Sabina has been resurrected and is considered uh, the kind of icon of Mazatec culture uh, to the world. And so uh, it is a very important uh, case study, and it's one of many examples of the use of, of psychedelics uh, in Mexican culture. Unlike our own culture after the Mexican Revolution of 1910 to 1917, uh, since there were so many indigenous and peasant people fighting in the armies, particularly of Zapata's Army of the South, um, the Constitution protected indigenous people's rights to practice their religion in the way they saw fit and to use a huge variety, not just psychedelics, but of, of medicinal and herbal medicine uh, in their practices. So Mexico, and as does Central America and South America, has a very rich living tradition of psychedelics uh, that's active today. Can you talk us through some of those uh, those communities throughout Central and South America uh, and some of the their psychedelic use and, and ritual and whatnot? Sure, absolutely. Let me let me kind of work our way down, and and let me just underscore this point I'm making because there <coughs> are probably about you know sixty to eighty varieties of psychedelics in use today in the new world where there's only a handful in the old world. Why? Because with the coming of monotheism in the old world, um, from the Middle East all the way through Europe, these practices got suppressed. But in the new world, once people lost access to Soma, and I want to make this important connection of the reindeer herders and other people who use Soma coming across the, um, the uh, Alaska um, Bering Land Bridge, and looking for other substances that would transport them, that would be a portal into the shamanic world of the supernatural. So we have today, for example, uh, peyote use among the Native American church, among the Apache, among the Kiowa, and other people. And I'll come back to this because this is one of two psychedelic substances that is in legal use in the United States uh, today because it has a long indigenous history. Uh, we have psilocybin use among the Mazatec of Oaxaca, and uh, there's also evidence that it was used among the uh, ancient Maya. Um, we have ayahuasca, obviously, among the Conibo, the Hivaro, uh, the Shipobo of uh, the Amazonian basis, basin. And uh, these are some of the most prominent. You have San Pedro cactus, which is used in the highlands of Peru. And these are some of the more uh, well-known and pervasive substances that have been used uh, throughout <coughs> throughout the New World. Now, uh, I'd love to get into all those uh, separate uh, cultures and, and their psychedelics, but um, fortunately, we have uh, just a limited amount of time, so I'd love to just get into the Christianity um, side of things. Now, Gordon Wasson... Did his sort of studies extend to Christianity at all? No. And that is a major finding and a major question of our book. Um, the 
one of the things, and there's a, a chapter in our book called The Battle of the Trees, and Wasson saw in a church of Plain Keralt in the center of France, it's a small chapel, actually. It's 60 feet deep by 20 feet wide. And there in the temptation scene of the Garden of Eden is a huge Amanita mushroom. Uh, and, and there are, for your listeners, there are uh, you know about 24 colored plates that show original photographs, all taken by Julie, of psychoactive mushrooms in Christian art, in frescoes, in ceiling paintings, in sculpture, in mosaic. In this one, you see Adam and Eve standing side by side. In between them is a giant Amanita mushroom with the very precise white dots um, etched into the cap. And the snake is wound around the base of the mushroom, offering a mushroom cap to Eve. And Adam and Eve are covering themselves, not with fig leaves, but with Amanita mushroom caps. Wasson saw this in 1952. And he fled. He never pursued his powerful theory about the role of entheogens, sacred plants that inspire the divine within, into Christianity. He never took it past the portals of Christianity. He never took it into the hallowed halls of Christianity. <clears throat> and this was a tremendous puzzle because this Wasson, he scoured the world for evidence of psychedelic in ancient cultures, from Asia to Latin America to Europe, obviously. Why did he stop? Had he gone just a little further down the road to the Church of St. Savannah, he would have seen um, in the creation scene a mushroom, uh, obvious mushroom, side by side with a pine tree. Obviously, these ancient artists and these uh, Benedictine monks, the, obviously, these ancient artists, Christian artists, and Benedictine monks who made these drawings knew the difference and showed us they knew the difference. And so we decided to, Wasson said, look, mushroom use in the Old Testament ended a thousand years before Christ. End of story. And because he was the preeminent authority on mushrooms in religion, it kind of closed the door for the study of Christianity. Well, we decided that the real way to honor Wasson is to follow his theory no matter where it went. And as we traveled from um, Canterbury Cathedral, Roslyn Chapel, as we traveled into uh, churches and chapels in France to Chartres Cathedral, uh, into ancient churches of Aquileia 300 AD in Italy, we found evidence of psychedelic mushrooms there. And eventually, we, we finally uncovered the secret of Wasson's greatest mystery. Why didn't Wasson pursue this theory? Was he afraid? Was he afraid of the power of the Vatican? Was it out of respect for his, his father as a minister? Was it out of respect? And it turns out that R. Gordon Wasson was that J.P. Morgan in those years represented the Vatican. They were a banker to the Vatican. And that's why we have a chapter, uh, Tony, called the Pope's Banker. And Wasson was their emissary to the Vatican and, in fact, had audiences with the Pope. Um, Wasson, and this is documented by colleagues of Wasson who worked with him at J.P. Morgan, who were interviewed in a book of uh, called Sacred Mushroom Seeker, which was a book of tributes to Wasson. So we're not making this up. It's, it's very well documented. But Wasson never discusses this ever in any of his writings. Uh, and it's sort of like saying that, you know, one of the major climate deniers, it all of a sudden turns out that he's been on the payroll of Exxon for 20 years. I mean, it's it just throws into question everything Wasson wrote criticizing other people who said, there is a holy mushroom theory in uh, Christianity. So we have the utmost respect for everything that Wasson accomplished, but we also feel that our, our work uh, is an extension of Wasson and takes it into areas that really needed to be studied to show not only is there an ancient cultures and, and Greek and, and uh, 
Hindu tradition with Soma, but we have it in our own Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. And we don't uh, offer this up in any way as a disparagement uh, because we cite of, of Christianity or to challenge um, Christianity, although this would be no doubt about it, a big stretch for the Catholic faith. But we quote in our book, Catholic brother David Stendhal Rost, who is of the order of St. Benedict. And he says, if we can encounter God through a sunrise seen from a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom prayerfully ingested? So we hope that our uh, book will open up a dialogue with the Christian community to say, look, there's a part of your roots here that's very well documented in the artwork of Christianity. And art was the Bible for the illiterate throughout the early uh, and high Middle Ages. And Christian fathers left this documentation of the important role of psychoactive plants in accessing the sacred. And it's time uh, we acknowledge that and re-engage with that part of our Judeo-Christian history. Now, now you said your journey started in uh, the Roslyn Chapel, Chapel in Scotland, where you saw that Amanita Muscaria sculpture. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about what happened once you saw that and some of the other notable chapels and pieces of art you came across throughout Europe? Absolutely. <clears throat> so the first thing that happened was um, we we not only saw that, but we saw a clue at Roslyn that pointed us to Ezra 2 in the Old Testament, um, That a clue that William St. Clair left there in Latin um, that led us back to Ezra 2 and led Julie uh, researching into Ezra 2, which was obviously a description of a psychoactive experience um, that that happened in the in the to Ezra's in the Bible. So this started us down a road of speculation. Look, if this is here in a Catholic church, how much more is out there waiting to be discovered? And just by this twist of faith that I had this background in ethnobotany and I knew this plant for what it was and could recognize it, did I see something that had sat there for 500 years, and Roslyn is extensively studied, I mean, through the Da Vinci Code and through many uh, associations with the Templars and secrets of the Bible, etc. It had not been discovered before. So it led us to the question of what else is out there? And uh, as a scientist, as a research-based scientist, I know what Carl Sagan said, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And if we were going to make any postulations or hypothesis about Christianity, which we knew would be highly controversial, we better have strong evidence to back it up. And we found strong visual evidence uh, at Roslyn Chapel. We went to Canterbury Cathedral in England where in an incredible illuminated manuscript called the Great Canterbury Psalter, <clears throat> there are images, um, dozens of images of psychoactive plants. And the cover of our book shows an image of God creating plants. It's the third uh, folio, it's the third painting in this illuminated, this painted manuscript, this painted Bible from Genesis. And God is actually there creating for psychoactive plants. So that was a stunning uh, discovery. We went uh, to Plain Coralt in the center of France and to the nearby Abbey of saint Sauvin, which is about five miles west of Plain Coralt in central France. And we found other images of distinct species of psychoactive mushrooms. And then we traveled to the Church of St. Martin of France, which is about two hours east. It's a small parish church. And there, as we walked into the choir, there were these, it was, it's a masterwork. I mean, the angels, the life of Christ, the drawings are magnificent. And these were restored to their original form. This is from about the 12th century. And there in an image of Jesus entering Jerusalem on the ass, the joyful youth 
who are greeting him are one of them is holding on to a giant mushroom cap. And there are five distinct, large, silk tan psilocybin mushroom caps. As Jesus moves and as you follow the choir wall to the towers of Jerusalem, the youth are cutting down giant mushroom caps on the top of the towers of Jerusalem. And this is right over the Last Supper where you have mushroom caps on the table. The same kind of knives that are used to cut the mushrooms in the other images are there. And this was, Tony, where we had our aha moment and saying, this is a psychedelic gospel. This is an alternative gospel. It's different from the canonic gospels in the Bible. It's different from the Gnostic gospels. Um, and it's a gospel in art. And art was the way in which the clergy communicated to the pagan royalty and to the faithful uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, we went on to St. Michael's Church in Germany, and here were bronze doors like uh, over 10, 15 feet high, a Christ column uh, cast by Bishop Bernward, who was a metallurgist, a mathematician. He founded a church. He was a tutor to the Holy Roman Otto, the Holy Roman Emperor, and he was eventually sainted. And the reason I, I emphasize all of this is to say, look, this is not some hippie cult of renegade priests who are practicing a mushroom cult deep in the forest of central France in the Middle Ages, far away from king and the church. This is in the highest echelons of Christianity. And he sculpted it. He, he cast it into the bronze figures and the mushroom images are so clear that ethnobotanists can tell these are liberty cap mushrooms. They can tell what species of psilocybin is actually being depicted. And his descendants, 200 years later, they drew a Jesse tree, which shows um, psychoactive mushrooms growing uh, in Eden. So this was uh, really an aha moment for us at St. Michael's Church in Germany. We went on to the Basilica of Aquileia, way in the northwestern corner of Italy near Trieste. And there, this is one of the oldest known churches. Uh, there, there is no Christian art before 200 for a variety of reasons. But this church was about 300, 330 AD. And there you see Amanita muscaria mushrooms uh, in the celebration chamber of the church. And they're very clear and distinct Amanita mushrooms. And they are magnificently depicted in these colorful mosaics that you can see today. In fact, what happened was the floor of the church was covered over about 1400 years ago, and then it was rediscovered. And then they saw this incredible, uh, you know, it went the length of the church, these magnificent mosaics that are now a UNESCO site that you can go and visit. Uh, we traveled into Turkey and we went and visited the cave churches of Turkey where early Christians as early as the first century fled uh, because Turkey, early Turkey was, was one of the sites of Christianity. They fled from Roman prosecution, which was quite horrible. And there we find uh, mushroom images in the dark church of Turkey, Turkey, in the cave churches of the Alhara Valley. Um, obviously, because of the, the early Christians were Jews, not to create an uh, injunction against having craven images. Uh, you, the poor don't make religious art and certainly don't build churches. So there is no datable Christian art before 200 BC. So in this case, we actually went back into the uh, New Testament and into the Gnostic Gospels. And we looked at them now with what I call Soma eyes. And we said, do we find evidence? You know, how do we explain things like Jesus saying, um, you know, he that eateth of my flesh and drinketh of my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Whosoever drink, eateth of my flesh and drinketh of my blood hath eternal life and I will rise him up on the last day. This is in the New Testament Gospel of John 6, 51 to, to 56. Is, is Christ talking about cannibalism? Obviously not. The Romans and the Jews alike would have found this repulsive. We believe that he's talking about the original Eucharist, which was a sacred uh, psychoactive plant. And there's an incredible passage in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. These are the Gnostic Gospels 
uh, which are said to be the, the true stories of the living Jesus Christ, where Jesus <coughs> says to Thomas, I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring, which I have measured out. He who will drink from my mouth will become like me. I shall become he and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. So obviously Jesus is talking to his disciple about a drink that he has measured out. He knows what the dosage is. And in that drink, we're going to have a transcendent experience. You're going to become like me and I'm going to become like you. And now we get into a very interesting aspect of the Gnostic teachings where God and man are one. They're not wholly separate. And Jesus didn't come to save man from sin. He came to teach enlightenment. So these, I know this is extremely controversial, and we ask people to look at our book, uh, evaluate the evidence, look at the pictures, read the analysis, and look at it with an open heart and an open mind, and with hopefully with, with fresh eyes. Now, now, these are coming from the Gnostic Gospels, and it's much different from the traditional uh, Bible that most know today. Can you talk a little bit about the history of where these uh, texts came from and um, how they point towards, you know, visionary plants and whatnot? Sure. Uh, these, you know, um, by obviously there were many different interpretations of early Christianity and, and the formalization of the canon gospels at the Council of Nicaea and, and other councils throughout history. That was a process of consolidation of what would be the true faith and what would be the true gospels. Um, the Gnostics were persecuted by about 200 on AD on once Orthodox Christianity start to started to assume theological and religious power. So these Gnostic Gospels were buried uh, because these, bo these books were ordered to be banned. Um, the people who, who practiced Gnosticism were persecuted. And these uh, Gnostic Gospels were buried in the sands of Egypt uh, near the town of Nag Hammadi in the upper Nile. Uh, and they lay buried under the sands, uh, these scrolls, for about 1,400 years until some uh, Arab shepherds uh, discovered them quite by accident around 1945 when they were looking for firewood uh, or for peat for, for firewood for kindling. And they broke open this large earthen jar and found these scrolls. Believe it or not, some of them were burned uh, at home by their uh, mother for firewood, uh, for fire. But they eventually made their way to the Coptic uh, Museum and libraries in Egypt, and people recognized that these were another gospel. And some of them were similar to the canon gospels of the Bible, but some of them were very different, um, showing a different interpretation that God and man are not separate, they're one, um, that Jesus did not come to to enlighten people from sin, and that the kingdom of heaven is within. And Jesus has said this in the Bible. Lo, look not here. Lo, look not there. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And he also had one teaching, a secret teaching for his disciples. And he said, you know, to you is given the true, the truth. But for them, I speak in parallels to, to the masses. And in the Gnostic Gospels, uh, they talk about, for example, in the Gospel of Philip, that um, there was an initiation, a mysterious initiation, an anointing of the initiate with chrism, um, uh, the co consecrated oil. And it's because of this chrism that Christ has his name, Christos, the anointed one. And the father anointed the son and the son anointed the apostles and the apostles anointed us. And everything is given in this bridal chamber which is where this ritual of resurrection, the light, the cross, and the Holy Spirit come together, opening up the kingdom of heaven uh, to people. So the Gnostic Gospels are known today. They're translated into English as the Nag Hammadi Library, and, and they're fascinating documents. I recommend them to everyone, and we interpret parts of them in our chapter on um, the kingdom of heaven, uh, where we look into the uh, reinterpretation of some of the passages. 
Uh, for example, in the Gnostic Gospels, they talk about Jesus says, you know, there are five trees in paradise which remain undisturbed summer and winter and who leaves will not fall. Whoever becomes acquainted with them will not experience death. Well, what trees have leaves that do not fall? Evergreen trees. So once again, we're talking about evergreens like the pine, the cedar, that are the host of the Amanita uh, muscaria. And these grew in Lebanon, which were accessible uh, in biblical times. Now, uh, in the, the book that you also said that Jesus was initiated into mystical practices uh, in Egypt during the missing years. Can you talk about this? Yes. Obviously, some people believe that Jesus went to India. And look, in this long period of time, it is not implausible that he traveled to India and was initiated there. Uh, we also believe that since the Holy Family, you know, initially fled um, to Egypt, that it is very plausible that Jesus went to Egypt during the missing years. Here is where many mystical Jewish and other cults were thriving, uh, some of which used psychedelics in their uh, religious practices. And we have to understand that Christianity grew out of a circum-Mediterranean area that was rife with shamanic practices, mystery cults of which the Eleusinian Mysteries is the most prominent. So uh, we make the argument that because there are these ancient practices of people traveling in ancient Egypt, and we go into the Egyptian literature and the Book of the Dead, and they it was not only a, a practice, of going to the underworld after death, the Pharaoh and others in the secluded chambers of the pyramids would travel out into the far world and return while alive. And this was a mystical journey that prepared the Pharaoh, kept the balance in the Egyptian world and prepared the Pharaoh and others for the afterlife. Uh, we found evidence of psychoactive plants, and there's a rich history of entheogens in Egypt that we talk about. That could be a whole book in itself. We talk about it in our chapter on the kingdom of heaven. And uh, there we, we provide a couple of images from ancient Egypt of uh, Amanita muscaria on tomb paintings and of the Torah, the psychoactive plants of the witches uh, that is being used to transport a devotee of Horus into the underworld. So we believe there's a rich psychoactive history in Egypt, and we believe that a plausible case can be made that Jesus was initiated uh, to these plants uh, during his so sojourn in Egypt. Now, are there any other areas that we haven't talked about in the Gnostic Gospel that pointed towards psychedelic use and uh, Jesus's use with psychedelics? Uh, yeah, there are a number of areas, and I, I've written a paper um, on the um, the role of psychedelics, and I cite it in the book on uh, sacred plants in the Gnostic Church. It's an article that I authored for the Journal of Ancient History in 2014. So it's sacred plants in the Gnostic Church, in which we elaborate on psychoactive plants um, in the Gnostic literature. So there is a good bit of literature there. As I say, um, <clears throat> could have written a whole book on the Gnostic Gospels, could have written a whole book on entheogenic Egypt. Um, but uh, we, we had to stay with our main theme of interpreting and analyzing the very powerful and prominent images of psychoactive plants, particularly mushrooms, found in Christian art. Now, the art, like you were saying, uh, it was used... Uh, to educate people. Most people in medieval times were illiterate and, um, you know, they couldn't read texts from uh, the Bible and uh, they couldn't read, you know, various um, uh, books on uh, on their religion. And it was used as a, art was used as a vehicle to teach. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. In other words, for the initiates, for people who were initiated into the use of psychedelics as one of the avenues. Now, let's let's just step back about a minute. You know, it's one thing to talk about ritual. It's another thing to talk about 
biblical texts and reading the Bible. But what if I, as uh, a leader of the church or as a religious follower or as a person eager for God, knew about a plant that God had created that could take me into the direct experience of the divine? And in the culture in which I participate, that's going to be direct experience of Jesus as a divine figure. And I can share that with others. There is nothing more powerful than the direct existential experience of God. And and I say, and Julie said uh, in our book, um, that our own uh, first authentic experience of the divine present came through psychedelics. And this is not just us. There are many reports of this through the ages. So we have it in the ancient literature. We have it in Christianity. And if you had that tool, uh, you would share it with with people who were uh, ready for the for the secret, for the sacred initiation. It wasn't for everybody. And this is why it was kept a secret. But here it was in the artwork. And if I am instructing you, I can point to these images. And here we have our written Bible, which you can't read. And here we have our illustrated and illuminated Bible. And this is going to be a lesson for you in what's coming and an initiation that you can actually existentially participate in. In the book, we talk about an experiment uh, that took place in 1962 called the Miracle of Marsh Chapel, in which two groups of Harvard Divinity students were divided, uh, 20 people, 10 each, 10 were given um, a psychoactive substance, 10 were given niacin B12, which makes the body feel flushed. And <coughs> this research, excuse me, Tony, and this research documented experimentally that psychoactive substances can induce a mystical experience. So we have evidence all over the place from ancient cultures, from modern cultures, from early psychedelic research. And this has been validated in during the psychedelic renaissance uh, today. So it is a very plausible line of argument. And uh, when you see all of this other evidence, uh, we introduce the, plaus- the possibility and plausibility that this also extended to early and medieval uh, Christianity. Now, at some point, the imagery in Christianity art uh, of mushrooms just disappeared. Uh, can you talk a little bit about sort of... Uh, sort of the, the, the church's role in suppressing some of this information and ending a lot of this art that was created? Sure. So essentially what happens is that with the coming of the Inquisition, and we have uh, in, in a chapter here, we say, look, what is St. George the Dragon Slayer, the Black Plague, and the witches have to do with each other? And it was after the horrible Black Plague, the most devastating uh, disaster in human history that took that that killed about a third of the population of Europe. Some people say up to 60 percent between about uh, 1348 and 1352. The church could not protect people from the Black Plague. So they blamed it on the witches. And it is at this time that you have the evolution in which the wise women and the herbalists, and these were men and women of the Middle Ages, the people who knew the psychoactive tradition, the people who knew how to use aphrodisiacs, the people who knew how to use uh, all kinds of plants to help with uh, ailments and pain and childbirth, that they became labeled as satanic witches. And the witch's ointment became a demonic brew. And after the papal bull declaring witchcraft to be a heresy punishable by death. This is when the chill kind of uh, falls over the, um, the whole role of psychedelics in European history. And that's where, look, the art could not be erased, but certainly a message went out from the Vatican that these kind of now pagan images uh, would not be tolerated. So it is at that point that we begin the break takes place in the use of psychedelics in the Western tradition from Eleusis 
all the way up through uh, Judeo-Christianity. Now, for those that want to know more about uh, sort of uh, psychedelic history and its role in a lot of uh, ancient cultures, or just generally want to learn more about psychedelics, are there any good books that the layman could read, or is there any great documentaries <laughs> that you would recommend? Sure. Um, absolutely. We have an extensive bibliography uh, in our book. It's a great place to start. Uh, we have blogs about these topics on our website, so you could go to www psychedeliggospels.com www.psychedeliggospels.com Our book is available on Amazon uh, if you just Google Psychedelic Gospels under books on Amazon and we have an extensive bibliography and depending on what your interest is whether it be Maria Sabina whether it be the Reindeer Herders we have great documents including all of Wasson's bibliography uh, pulled together for you uh, in our bibliography, and you can find it all right there. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thanks so much for sitting down with me. Um, all the links that we talked about will be on the blog post for you guys. Uh, and then check out his site, uh, Psychedelic Hospitals. Um, and Jerry, thanks so much for sitting down with me. It was uh, I'm so fascinating hearing this, and hopefully we can have a part two at some point because there's a lot of topics that we just didn't have the time to cover certainly, including the whole current psychedelic renaissance. Tony, thank you for taking the time to digest and, and have such intelligent and thoughtful questions. And I appreciate your uh, having me on your on your uh, post. All right. That was Dr. Jerry Brown. I want to say a special thanks to him for sitting down with me. Uh, go check out his site, psychedeliggospels.com. Check out his book, The Psychedelic Gospels. And in it, you'll find a lot more information of all the different topics that we covered in today's episode. You're going to find all the high quality images that Jerry, Jerry Brown's wife, Julie, uh, shot for that project. And um, you'll just learn a lot more about all the different topics that we covered in today's episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, Warrior Radio. Uh, give us a rating, leave a comment, and tell a friend. So with all that said, Thank you for sitting down with me today, and I will see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.